Welcome as we retrace the road to victory. October 6, 1990 saw the culmination of 32 years of struggle, ridicule and humiliation as the Collingwood Football Club once again regained its title as the most famous and successful sporting club in Australia. With 13 premierships till 1958, Collingwood was without doubt the most talked about club in the game. But until then, the talk was more envy and admiration. Over the next 32 years, while maintaining an undying loyalty from its supporters, Collingwood stood back and watched as, firstly, its proud record of the most premierships in the league was overtaken by two clubs, and then watched as eight grand final attempts failed. Even more damning, they watched as the impossible almost became reality when the club almost went under. Even when Collingwood was experiencing the heartbreak of yet another grand final defeat, there was always next year. But in April 1986, Collingwood faced its blackest hour. Not only had the team lost its first three games, the club was $3.5 million in debt and the banks had had enough and wanted the Collingwood Football Club to close its doors. As a result, players were ordered to take a 20% salary cut or leave. Some chose the latter, but the bloodletting on the 14th of April 1986 will be remembered forever. The total is 3,786 to 1,055. <laughs> Just three and a half years after the new Magpies had swept to power in a blaze of glory and media hype, the dream had turned into a nightmare. Led by newspaper entrepreneur Ranald McDonald, the new Magpies went on an orgy of spending for little gain. On the 14th of April, McDonald resigned, the general manager Peter Bain was sacked, and a man whose heart and soul is black and white, Bob Rose, stood down as coach. I'm, I'm facing facts. I'm coach of the senior side, and we haven't, haven't won a game, and that's just as not good, and I, personally, I can't accept that. But as usual, Bob Rose, who already was a club legend as a player, decided his place was on the board for the best interests of the club, handing the reins to his assistant, Lee Matthews. Matthews joined Collingwood after a truly remarkable career at Hawthorne with the enticement of the romance of being the coach to lead Collingwood to a premiership. He also liked the idea that he would serve an apprenticeship under Rose. Little did he know that he would be thrust onto the stage after just three rounds of football. I obviously didn't expect to be senior coach here until, until next year but uh, you can't always decide the circumstances under which a job is taken and uh, I was asked to take over and I was only too happy and enthusiastic to do it. After such ludicrous suggestions, such as Robert Holmes' court being offered the presidency, the last remaining new magpie, Alan McAllister, a grassroots Collingwood supporter, took over the job. Rob Petrie took over as general manager and former player Graham Allen became team manager. The first game was at home against Geelong. And even in this first match, Matthews had very definite ideas about how he wanted the game to be played. This is where it's hard. This is when your legs open. Whatever you're feeling, they're open. The Magpies emerged winners by 45 points. The first very tentative step towards recovery had been made and a sigh of relief could be felt wherever Australian football is played. In the end, Collingwood missed the finals behind Essendon on percentage. Brian Taylor kicked 100 goals and significantly, the under-19s, where a number of the 1990 Premiership side started, won the flag. 1987, however, was a horror year. Collingwood finished 12th, their equal lowest effort in their history. In 1988, Collingwood were back in the race for the flag, finishing the year in second place, a magnificent achievement. Would this be the year? With Matthews at the helm, anything looked possible, but losses to the two teams hated the most by Collingwood in the finals saw the end of 1988, another year of disappointment. In 1989, it was much the same. The club finished fifth on the ladder and yet another loss to Melbourne in the elimination final, this time by 23 points after leading at half-time, saw the Matthews-led Magpies out in straight sets in two final series and the question was being asked yet again, were this group of Collingwood players like those of the past 32 years and was Matthews the man to lead them on the road to victory? So to season 1990 and with it the usual amount of optimism that is around at the start of a football year at Victoria Park. But the experts had yet again predominantly written the side off, even before a ball had been kicked in anger. After two years of unproductive finals football, many believed that while Collingwood would win their share of games, fifth spot would be about as good as the Magpie Army could expect. Even with star recruits Scott Russell and Tony Francis in the side. 
Langdon slaps it out wide. Traditionally with the ladder all square and optimism at its highest, Collingwood fans swarm to the opening home and away match. But in season 1990, the first Collingwood game in the AFL competition had to be watched from Perth as the Magpies took on the West Coast Eagles in their first year under a Victorian coach in Michael Malthouse. As expected, the highly talented Eagles had been steeled by their rugged coach and came out blazing. The Eagles led from the second minute of play and did not relinquish the lead and with Peter Sumich kicking six goals, Collingwood made the long trip home to Melbourne Loses by 46 points. The headlines read, no forward line and brittle under man-to-man -man pressure. And worse still, star rover Tony Francis in his first game and on his 21st birthday was reported for kicking Murray Rance and subsequently suspended for six matches. After round one, Collingwood were in 12th position on the AFL ladder. After such a discouraging performance against the Eagles, Collingwood in round two faced arch enemy Carlton at Waverley. The Blues also suffered a first round loss by five points to Sydney, but went into the match clear favourites. Carlton coach Alex Jezelenko summed up the feeling going into this match when he said there are two games you must win when you play for Carlton. Collingwood at home and Collingwood away. And the feeling at Victoria Park was exactly the same. The Blues opened the better and led at quarter time by 20 points. That lead was reduced to nine points at half time and two points at the final change. What happened in the final quarter was the first sign of the potential the Collingwood team of 1990 possessed. The Pies slammed on seven straight goals from the 24 minute mark of the third quarter to the 10 minute mark of the last. The maestro, Peter Dacos, went mad in the second half, kicking seven goals after starting the day on the halfback flank. Banks has come into it since Silmani's moved off him. There's Barwick. Sets it up for his forwards. Dorotic taps the ground. Tuckham! An open goal. Beautiful hand pass to Dacos. Goal number six coming up for Dacos. He's put it through, I feel. Yes, he has. Francisco got a fist to it. Brown still running. Oh, look at this boy go. But claimed by Alma. Dacos to right. Is this another one? I think he's kicked it. Alban, Tudnam, the race is on. Tudnam uses the body nicely. Tries to spoon it out to Banks. Caught by Hannah and Alban. Tudnam again, on to Manson. The big man's clear. He shoots. And he has kicked a miraculous goal. He'll do something magical. Yes, out to the right, hook it back. Has he put it through? Yes, it's a goal to the Magpies. As it's tapped on beautifully, Gavin Brown's been great when the pressure's been applied. He goes short to half forward, it's fisted the ground. Banks off the ground, he's enjoyed Silvani being moved off him as he kicks it up to Dacos. Dacos against Tom Elvin. Dacos under the left foot, is this a miraculous goal? A brilliant effort by Dacos, goal number seven. Skipper Tony Shaw amassed 42 possessions, but Darren Mullane was reported and subsequently found guilty of striking Stephen DeRui and rubbed out for three matches. Despite that, Collingwood, 19-8-122, defeated Carlton in front of 44,000 people, 13-9-87, moving to eighth place on the ladder with Essendon on top. Round three saw Collingwood play their first game of the season at home at Victoria Park. And it was against another interstater, on this occasion the Sydney Swans. Nearly 28,000 people packed out Victoria Park to see Collingwood play impressive first and last quarters and serviceable quarters in between. Scott Russell, the South Australian signing, was beginning to show that even though he didn't arrive with the hype of Tony Francis to the club, he was going to be a huge part of Collingwood's attempt on the flag with 36 possessions. Defender Craig Kelly was reported and suspended on a trial by video charge for striking Mark Bays. Bays missed most of the season with a dislocated shoulder from the incident. But the biggest blow was the injured knee suffered by 1989 best and fairest player Gavin Brown. Tudnam kicked four and Manson and Dacos three each. Final scores, Collingwood, an accurate 20 goals, 8, 128. The Swans, an inaccurate 12, 21, 93. Collingwood to seventh place on the ladder. Round four saw the Magpies play host to Footscray and it was here that Peter Dacos showed once and for all that he is a forward player. Dacos was magnificent as he kicked six goals to three-quarter time as the Magpies raced away to lead by 50 points at three-quarter time. 
The magpie forward was fed brilliantly by a cohesive defence, and when Tony Shaw had put Tony McGuinness out of the game, he went off and picked up another 34 possessions. But at three-quarter time, the magpies went to sleep, and Footscray slammed on four goals in 11 minutes. The Bulldogs eventually booted six goals to Collingwood's one to reduce the deficit to 18 points. But the Magpies were home, not as convincing as they would have hoped, but home just the same. Dacos kicked six and Paul Tudnam four goals as Collingwood in front of 17,000 people defeated Footscray 14-12-96 to 11-12-78. Round five and the interest shown in a Collingwood game saw the Pies play St Kilda at the MCG in front of 68,000 people. The Saints went into the game equal second place. Tony Lockett on top of the goal kicking with 28 goals from four games and their best start in years under new coach Ken Sheldon while Nicky Winmar was in great form. But an inaccurate Collingwood led narrowly all day in one of the real nail biters of the year. Saints supporters had come to see their team throw everything at Collingwood and they did. Now a chance for Rice to get it wide into Harding. The handball is not a good one. Tugnan, the opportunist, to Dacos. 30 metres out. He steadies, shoots, he goes. Peter Dacos may have been inaccurate kicking two goals four for the afternoon, but once again he proved a match winner. With his experience coming into play, Dacos induced a free kick late in the final quarter when Kane Taylor, who had played well until that moment, was caught retaliating by the umpire. Dacos, cool as ice, picked out the loose man Alan Richardson and Collingwood were just out of the Saints' reach. Can cover himself in glory. Kicks and goals. Tony Lockett kicked a goal right on the siren to register his seventh for the day and 500th career goal, but the deficit was one point in favour of the Woods. The same margin St Kilda had won the 1966 grand final by on this same ground. And for the first time, Collingwood were in the five in fourth place. So to round six, and the Magpies were back at the MCG for a relocated game, this time against Essendon. 63,000 people turned out to see a great game of football as Collingwood led first by five points at quarter time and then went in level at the major break. But slowly Essendon started to get on top of Collingwood who were without Brown and Dacos. The lead seesawed all day before Derek Kickett started to dominate out of the centre for Essendon. Ron McEwen, who played brilliantly, went to the forward line for Collingwood but despite pulling in some great marks was unable to convert kicking three behinds. Doug Barwick was Collingwood's most effective forward with three goals. But Essendon were able to run out 26-point winners, breaking away in the last 15 minutes to win 15-11-101 to 10-15-75. The win saw Essendon jump to third place and Collingwood fall out of the five to seventh place on the ladder. After losing to the Bombers, Collingwood faced Hawthorne, the winner of the past two premierships, for the first time in 1990. Yet again, Collingwood put in a strong effort, only to go down narrowly, this time by just two points. As has become a habit against Collingwood, Jason Dunster was in great form, kicking six goals. While for Collingwood, Barwick and Dacos booted three goals each. The Hawks were coming off a shock loss to St Kilda the previous week, and obviously were looking to regain credibility. Graham Wright had another top day, particularly in the third quarter when Collingwood came from 30 points down to lead by 10 points going into the final quarter. Morris a high kick out of defence. McGuan, sensational mark into Krasiska. And on to right again, two in a minute. He's done it again. Christian paddles it. Came off the shin, but it finishes up with Wright, who has slashed them to pieces in this quarter. Through Dacos it goes. Mightn't be bad for the team. Krasiska to Dacos. Dacos for goal, and the pass are in front. Monkers goes long towards half forward. Stasevich is the target. Morris gets the first on it. McGuan, little chip pass into the path of Christian. Collins closing. The handball comes away to Brown. Slips the tackle and slips. Gets to his feet. Brilliant smother Collins. Krasiska the half chance. Collins crashes in. Claimed by Manson. McGuan an opportunity. Running away from his own goal. Dacos measures the options. And finds Barwick. 
He kicks from about 35 metres out. It's bending back. Collingwood increased their lead. What a comeback. Gaither In the final back. term, Collingwood made a vital mistake when Michael Gaither, who had held Dermot Brereton, attempted to pass to Shane Morwood across the goal, but found Jason Dunstall, who converted this unlikely opportunity. In the end, a great goal to Paul Deere was the difference between the two teams as Hawthorne, 13-16-94, defeated Collingwood 13-14-92. Despite this setback, little did Collingwood fans realise that over the next nine weeks, the Magpies would put together nine wins in a row and set up the double chance in the finals. As the cold, wet months hit Melbourne, it was testimony to coach Lee Matthews and the mental toughness of his team that Collingwood were able at this time to stamp their authority on the competition. Round eight and Collingwood could not get going against Fitzroy at all for the first three quarters. The Magpies trailed by 17 points at three-quarter time and it looked like they could well lose touch with the five. But the final quarter saw Peter Dacos, Gavin Brown and Paul Tudnam slam on nine of Collingwood's ten last quarter goals, turning what could have been an expensive loss into a 45-point win. Once the Pies had a sniff of victory, they went right on with it, booting six goals in the last ten minutes to send their supporters home very happy indeed. Dacos booted six goals and Manson and Brown three each as Collingwood 17-18-120 defeated Fitzroy 9-21-75 for Collingwood's first win at Princes Park since 1981. Round nine saw Collingwood finally click. At home to an always dangerous North Melbourne side, Collingwood went mad in a high scoring affair. Peter Dacos and Gavin Brown dominated the match, kicking seven goals each as Collingwood won by 80 points. The goal of the day coming yet again from the maestro, Dacos, deep in the pocket in front of the Bob Rose stand. Brown set the scene with four first quarter goals, taking marks at will. While leading by 29 points at half time, North were able to fight back to trial by just 16 points, 23 minutes into the third quarter. But Collingwood steadied and slammed on 11 final quarter goals to win 26-20, 176 to North Melbourne, 14-12, 96. Round 10 saw an opportunity for Collingwood to gain credibility against Melbourne at Waverley. At 4.45, the Magpies had stamped themselves a definite contender, belting Melbourne by 52 points. Melbourne opened with the opening two goals of the game and did not kick another until the third quarter, by which time the game was over. Darren Mullane kicked an inspirational second quarter goal. coming in Mullane, crashing his way through. Vintage Darren Mullane, great play. While Dacos's sixth was a beauty, a magnificent one-hander, and then a ball-bursting torpedo that had the fans screaming for more. And then sets sail and drills it through. Final scores: Collingwood 16, 14, 110; Melbourne 9, 4, 58. To round 11, and the winning sequence continued as Collingwood journeyed north to Carrara to take on the Brisbane Bears. While it was always a game that the Magpies were going to win, the 34-point victory gave Collingwood third spot on the ladder, a game clear of Hawthorne and the West Coast Eagles. The match saw the retirement of former Collingwood captain Mark Williams, who decided at halfway mark of the season to leave Brisbane and return to his former side, Port Adelaide. After kicking away early, Collingwood were never in any danger and cruised to the line convincing winners. Dacos kicked four, Starsevich and Manson three, while Mullane with 32 possessions was the best for the Pies. Again. To round 12 and once again the Magpie faithful were on their way to Waverley for their match against last year's glamour side and runners-up Geelong. The Cats desperately needed a win after a mixed start to the season, while the Magpies needed to win to stay within percentage of top spot and a game clear of fourth place. The Magpies started slowly as an inaccurate Geelong kicked four goals nine to 2-1 in the first quarter. While Collingwood failed to dominate the match, the game showed that as a team, the Collingwood combination was maturing as the Pies slowly overhauled the Cats. There he is, adding one more stat. McEwen at the back, oh gee, nearly. Gets up, kicks a goal, and puts it through. Great effort from McEwen. Scott Russell from centre wing kicks long. Inside 50, McEwen comes out. He used it at large body of his. Hocking had the ball and then lost it just as quickly. Morgan, the hurried hand pass. Bowick bounces once, twice. Won't get that. Dacos snaps. Steps truly for a goal. 
Both sides battling hard. Hocking, Francis. Left foot snapshot by Francis. It's a great shot by Tony Francis. Has had a great last quarter. Russell, looping hand pass to Risa Larkas. Kicks from right on 50. Another one would be interesting here. McEwen at the back, can't mark, but goals! In the end, Collingwood won by 11 points with McEwen kicking three goals. Craig Kelly was reported for striking Gary Hocking but was cleared by the tribunal. Final scores, Collingwood 14-15-99, Geelong 12-16-88. Collingwood made it six in a row with a 59-point victory over Richmond at Victoria Park. With the bitter wind blowing across the famous ground, the young Tigers were never really a chance. Rovers, Francis and Russell were again in top form while the defence was impenetrable. On a wing, Darren Mullane was on fire as he carved up his opposition. He was the only one who really wanted that ball then as he kicks in front of goal. Up the ground, here's Dacos. Step to goal. Yes! Oh, oh great play, Peter, Peter Dacos. Bauer, not a good kick. Mullane with a chance. Still Mullane with power oh. and precision. And has he put it through? Yes. The goal he kicked bursting through three opponents set up the Pies' win and left the Magpies in second place with only percentage still separating the Magpies from the Bombers on top. Round 14 saw the Magpies equal on top with 10 wins having played all teams. If Subiaco Oval is inhospitable in early April, Victoria Park in mid-winter with the Magpies on a roll is just damn frightening. It was a battle between second and fourth but on paper only. Collingwood were never going to lose this game, despite the West Coast kicking four of the first five goals, but that was it. The Magpies went on a goal rampage, booting 10 of the next 11 goals to grab a 39-point lead midway through the third quarter to seal the game. Darren Mullane was again at his best with 32 possessions and three goals, including another pack-bursting goal to the Sharon stand end. Losing ground, losing a bit more. Mullane outside 50. Cornered by Yugo. Gets around Yugel and Wilson. Mullane for goal. A sensational kick. Brown goes to get around. Now he does. And kicks a miraculous goal. May not have been the best one. Rance unloads a big kick. But it's offline. McEwen. What a mark. Mick Malthouse described the Eagles' effort as disgraceful and bagged his players in no uncertain terms after the match. But it didn't matter to Collingwood, who won the game 15-12-102 to 11-10-76. With the Eagles paid back for their earlier humiliation of the Black and Whites, it was time yet again to face the old enemy, Carlton. Back out at Waverley and with a massive 76,000 supporters there to watch the action. And this was the game that the doubters were finally put to rest. The Magpies were back in town. In one of the great performances of the year, Collingwood absolutely towered Carlton to the tune of 54 points. It was a display of controlled ferocity mixed with teamwork and skill. Overrunning at Christian. Tackled by Rennitz. Back goes Dacos. Handball over the top. Opportunity Richardson. Unselfishly to Russell. Russell up to the goal square. Brown marks. Dean and Banks. Banks one hand almost. Rennitz. Dean on the up. Blackwell. Caught by Dacos. And again, the numbers Banks, Brown, Dacos, and this will be a goal. Russell from forward of centre kicks it to within 35 metres. Collingwood again swoop on it. McGuan, beautiful kick by McGuan. Plays on. Just chips it towards Herman, but Wright's got it. And look at the rebound now. Dacos on the lead. Look at that. Gavin Brown kicked three goals, but was reported on a trial by video charge of headbutting David Kernahan, only to get off later at the tribunal. But there was no stopping Collingwood. Staying in second place behind Essendon, the Pies won 17-11-113 to Carlton, 8-11-59. 2-0 against Carlton for the year. Only a premiership could be better. The winning feeling continued through round 16 as Collingwood went to Sydney for their third and last interstate excursion for the year. It was another case of a lesser team throwing everything at the Pies. As always, their opponents had lifted for Collingwood. A victory here would make their season seem worthwhile. Collingwood had 14 more scoring shots, played badly and won 
a good sign. It also signalled for the first time since round 21, 1981, the first time the Woods had held top spot on their own. The win provided Collingwood with their best sequence of wins, nine since 1970, a year they should have won the flag. Final scores Collingwood 21-21, 147, Sydney 19-9, 123, the Magpies on top at last. After nine wins in a row, even the players were starting to wonder when would the inevitable loss come. Not in the finals again, surely. So it came to many as some sort of perverse relief that Collingwood finally dropped the game in round 17 against everybody's second side in 1990, Footscray. And while ground was not lost, Collingwood remained equal, if not outright leader, those old end-of-season doubts were to reappear over the next four weeks. So to round 17, and once again the prospect of a huge Collingwood crowd saw Footscray decide to transfer their Western Oval game to the MCG. A decision that was worth over $100,000 because of the Collingwood Army's support. For Footscray, this game would be their grand final. And for a few weeks yet, keep alive their dream of making the finals less than a year after facing extinction. In front of nearly 58,000, the Bulldogs held Collingwood goalless in the first quarter and then led by 27 points at half time and then 28 points at the final change. That led to an epic final quarter. Collingwood fans were waiting for the final quarter comeback and they received it with the Magpies clawing their way to the lead late in the game and the match and a tenth straight win looked secure. Kerrison's drop punt. Campbell in the front spot. Dacos taps it to Barwick and Barwick kicks the goal. 9-17 to 13-8. Christian with him. Christian in the front spot. Royal and Shaw. Shaw does brilliantly to Turner. They can attack now to McGuan. McGuan thumps it to full forward. McEwen. Wine. Makes a mistake. Takes forever. Oh. McEwen. Caught. Dacos goal. Left foot puts it through. And Collingwood is back. Davies goes for the punch. Over the back. It's all Collingwood. Wham White. He goes to Turner. Will it tip for him? Yes, it does. Jamie Turner. Pulled off the ball just as he kicks it, but it's at half forward. Foster racing after it. Tony Shaw, the short one to Bex. A goal coming up by the end of the Magpies. Bex is marked. They want this. Maybe two points in front of him. Kicks this. Dennis Banks' has goal. The Magpies have hit the front. But just as people were looking for the record books, young Footscray rover Stephen Collinook produced a piece of magic. After spending most of the day on the interchange bench, Collinook took on Graham Wright, who was suffering an injured ankle, and left him standing, and then backed himself in to kick a magnificent goal, and the Bulldogs were home in a great game of football by three points. Final scores in Collingwood's first loss in two and a half months. Footscray, 14-12-96. Collingwood, 12-21-93. If there was some feeling of mercy in losing to Footscray the previous week, there was none when the Magpies played host at Victoria Park to St Kilda. It was an extraordinary day. The Saints were sucked into fights all afternoon, particularly Nicky Winmar and Jimmy Cracker, the latter receiving an enforced holiday for striking Shane Kerrison. Between the 20-minute mark of the first quarter and the 23rd of the third quarter, Collingwood booted 10 goals to none. When Ruckman Damien Monkhorst wasn't giving Saints full forward Tony Lockett hurry up in front of the Magpie cheer squad, full back Craig Kelly was making the Brownlow medalist look cemented to the goal square. Twice Kelly galloped the length of Victoria Park to accept the ball and should have kicked two goals, but the effort in his runs must have been too much. Nevertheless, the action served to emphasise the dominance that Collingwood had all afternoon. On a wing, Darren Mullane was simply sensational and dominated the entire afternoon. If ever the Sharon belonged to anyone, it was Mullane this day. On the negative side, it looked like the season would be over for veteran Dennis Banks, who suffered a broken wrist at a time he was playing the best football of his career. As usual, Dacos kicked four, including the best of the afternoon, and for an encore, pulled in the mark of the day as well. Final scores, Collingwood 16-21, 117. St Kilda, 68 points in arrears, 7-7-49. Round 19 and in possibly the match of the season, the heavyweights top of the ladder Collingwood and Essendon met at Waverley. Such was the interest that not only was the game transferred from Windy Hill to house the massive crowd, but the match was televised, the first for a home and away game. 
Many believed it would be a grand final preview, and the match lived up to its rave billings. Played in miserable conditions, the match was a game of hard, tough football. Essendon lost Watson early with an ankle injury. James Manson once again showed he is as unpredictable as Melbourne's winter weather, missing from point-blank range twice and then booting a ripper over his shoulder. The crowd just yelled, that's our Charlie. Peter Dacos in his 200th game was tagged brilliantly by Gary O'Donnell, so much so that he was moved to defence to get a touch. The past six grand finals have been won from top spot and Essendon cemented their claim with their victory. Gavin Brown was held by Hamilton, but in his return game broke away finally and kicked five great goals to bring the Pies right back into the game after trailing by 28 points at the last change. Turnout to Dacos, beautifully picked up, he puts it on the ground, terrific skill shown by Dacos. He gets under the right foot and kicks to the half forward line, he's found Gavin Persista. But they, can they find a loose man? The short one is on Gavin Brown, is it a mark? Brown and Hamilton. It's still Brown. Left foot. And has he kicked it? No, he has. Yes, he has. A brilliant goal. It's fifth. Turner, Francis and Brown were the Pies' best in a match that was typified by this show of desperation. Despite losing by a goal, Collingwood left the field knowing that on their day, they could account for Essendon. Final scores, the Bombers, 13-6-84, Collingwood, 11-12-78. While great heart was taken from the Essendon loss, Hawthorne delivered a savage blow to the solar plexus, which saw the wind well and truly knocked out of Collingwood in round 20. Many believe Collingwood was still flat after the Essendon game, but the truth is the Magpies were given a hiding. And no matter how much cajoling went on, the old doubts had resurfaced just two weeks before the real stuff. Jason Dunstall, back after a fractured skull, provided the Hawthorne knockout blow, kicking 11 goals. How he loves to play Collingwood. Tony Shaw and Tony Francis tried hard in a vain attempt, but from start to finish, Collingwood were thrashed. The Pies remained second on the ladder, but now only a game separated them from fifth place and percentage from the loss of the finals double chance. The Vultures were circling. Final scores, Hawthorne 26-7, 163, Collingwood 12-8-80, the darkest hour in Collingwood's year. So to round 21, and after much soul-searching, it was time for Collingwood to dig deep. Little at this stage did any magpie dare to think or even dream that the Hawthorne debacle would be the last loss for the year. Collingwood were under pressure. Brian Taylor, who for so long was not part of Lee Matthews' master plan to win the flag, was brought back. Collingwood, over the next two weeks, would regroup and hit the finals full of running and confidence. After such a thrashing and the fingers being pointed from everywhere, Collingwood responded the only way they could against a lacklustre Fitzroy side, by belting them by 86 points at Victoria Park. The big BT was back with the opening goal of the day and finished with four, as did Peter Dacos, while Jamie Turner slotted home three. The defence was in sensational form, holding the Lions to just four goals and 12 scoring shots for the afternoon, as well as usual, setting up Collingwood's forward attacks. However, two setbacks were injuries to key players. Tony Shaw injured his knee, but as usual believed he would not even miss a game. He didn't. Darren Mullane was a different story, however. His injury, reported as a wrist injury, was far different. His thumb had been broken, and only a superhuman effort would see him play any further part with the finals only a game away. Final scores, Collingwood 17-16-118 to Fitzroy 4-8-32. Many gave North Melbourne a big chance of providing an upset in the final match of the season. But it was to be another Collingwood demolition job. Opening with a quarter-time lead of 13 points, stretching it to 22 at half-time, Collingwood had established a base from where, at this time of the season, they should crunch any side remotely inferior, and that's what happened. The short knee injury kept the captain quiet early, as did the attention of opposite number Matthew Larkin, but Shaw finished with 28 possessions. But it mattered little as Collingwood completely dominated the game to go into the final series with two thrashings under their belt. 
John Longmire of North Melbourne, despite having some 14 opportunities to kick four goals, ended with just two and 98 for the season. Final scores in the final home and away game of 1990, Collingwood 23-18-156 defeated North Melbourne 8-19-67. And so to the finals, the first under the banner of the Australian Football League. Essendon finished minor premiers on top with 68 points, calling it with their two great games to end off the year in second place, one game behind, equal on points but a massive 11.8% in front of the West Coast Eagles, who knocked off Melbourne for the double chance by 5.2%. Hawthorne, who lost to Melbourne in the final round, would attempt to win three flags in a row and enter a record eight grand finals in succession from fifth place. So came the finals, and in Lee Matthews' previous two years, the Magpies had disappeared in straight sets. In 1988, despite the double chance, and in 1989, in the elimination final. In fact, it hadn't been since 1984 that Collingwood had won a finals match. Again, that year ended in tragedy. A record 133-point thrashing by Essendon in the preliminary final. And no one needed to be reminded that Collingwood had not tasted the ultimate success since 1958 when the Pies won a then record 13th flag. Would 1990 be any different from the previous 32 years of heartbreak? A date with the West Coast Eagles on Saturday, September 8 in the qualifying final would not enlighten us any at all. Here's the call. The coin's in the For the third year in a row, Collingwood were back in the finals. The club had never won a qualifying final before. Their opponents, the West Coast Eagles, had never won a finals match in their short history. So somebody was going to create history, or so we thought. Collingwood did all the early attacking, even if Francis was attacking the wrong way. Gavin Brown had the jitters early, but still was able to kick Collingwood's third goal. Being treated kindly by the umpires. At the other end, the defence was forcing the Eagles forwards to run out to the 50 metre line, but it didn't affect Peter Sumich at all. Sumich can pull it back to five points. At quarter time, an inaccurate Collingwood 3-6 to the Eagles, three goals won. Early in the second quarter, Peter Sumich slammed on two quick goals and at the 14-minute mark of the quarter, the scores were level after two tremendous efforts by the Eagles' full forward. Collingwood have got back in numbers. The short pass comes into Sumich though. A kick from about 45 metres. He likes these sort of kicks. That is a magnificent kick. Six minutes later and the lead would change hands as it would seven times for the remainder of the match when Carl Langdon kicked a huge goal. Too far out to score. Pardon me. That is a magnificent kick. What a superb kick. But it took another individual effort from Gavin Brown to put the Woods back in front by a point. Hasn't got the distance all what a fine mark. Then some brilliant teamwork between Stasevich, Turner, Brown and finally Doug Barwick saw Collingwood move to a six-point lead. That's not a mark that time. Good ball, Brown. Snapshot by Barwick. Dacos took a magnificent mark under pressure and with the crowd calling for a torpedo, the great man let one go that split the goals and Collingwood were 11 points in front. Having kicked his 400th career goal, Dacos kicked his third for the match, combining with Barwick, booting it through from 45 metres out. But another Sumich goal from 50 metres saw the difference just six points. We'll see. Low trajectory kick. And this was reduced to just one when Waterman, just on the ground, bagged another long goal. From about 49 metres, and he's got the distance. That's an excellent kick for a goal. But Collingwood surged the game. Russell to the dashing right. Then James Manson marked strongly for Collingwood and ignored a lead from Brown in the goal square. Manson had faith in his own goal kicking. If he was squinting into the sun, Collingwood supporters had their eyes shut as Big Manson dobbed it from the boundary line. But just when it looked like that goal would give the Woods breathing space going into the final quarter, Chris Lewis produced some magic. From nowhere, he dodged and snapped a goal in his left foot that would have been the goal of the day, but better was yet to come. The Eagles, a 10-8, Collingwood, a 9-12 Turner. Lewis had been damaging out of the middle all day, 
And right on the siren, he was very damaging to Jamie Turner's middle. Just two points separated the sides going into the last quarter. And it was the Eagles who struck first. Hetty bursting through half forward. Directly in front, Sumich likes it. It's a goal, the Eagles in front. And then Lewis marked 40 metres out Lewis and made no mistake. Lewis, 50 metres out. To the city end goal at BFL Park. That might be there. It's that brought on the great comeback. Contest, Brian Taylor, who had kicked two off. points from four shots in the first quarter and was bent since half time, kicked two of the most Taylor. important goals of his life and was very happy to let the Both Eagles know the all about quarter. them. From the pocket, but directly in front now, should goal and does. Four points the difference. To the run of Francis. The crowd at fever pitch. Francis pumps it in. In front. Oh. Taylor was interfered with surely. Yes. Yeah. Free kick there over the shoulder against Murray Rance. So we've got the unlikely hero, Brian Taylor. A chance to kick his second goal in the last five minutes. And if he does, Collingwood will be back in front. As Ryan Taylor. So long in the seconds this season. Kicks and kicks truly. Then came the passage of play of the year. First Mullane cleaned up Warsfold, then he and Brown set up Dacos for a goal, the likes that has never been seen before and is likely to be seen ever again. Back to Mullane, likewise. Dacos nearly runs out of room. He's goal! It was the Magpies by eight points. Then Carl Langdon kicked a magnificent goal and Collingwood led by a point with only seconds to go. Seconds behind, and we've got a long time. kick forward, Langdon. and Peter Sumich running with the ball marked in front of McEwen. His kick would decide the fate of this game. It's a question of whether they can win. Well, it's just a question of accuracy now from Peter Sumich. Clock ticking down. He's in the wrong pocket. This could be a kick after the siren job. He'll take his time. The umpire's called time on here, too. Dennis he has. So the clock is frozen. Peter Sumich. After two hours of drama, the finals had been thrown into confusion. There was no result. We'd all have to come back again next week. Final scores, West Coast Eagles 13-12-90, Collingwood 13-12-90. In the qualifying replay, the tempo right from the word go lifted considerably and emotion spilled out across the field. Peter Sumich, the man who could have caused another Collingwood loss the week before, made no mistake with his kick from the pocket, but was flattened for his trouble by Michael Christian. A fracas developed immediately. Christian was reported, but later cleared by the tribunal. And half the players involved, Sumix has kicked the goal. But with Collingwood showing tremendous aggression at the ball, it wasn't long before the pies were on the scoreboard, with James Manson marking and kicking the goal. Manson. Levels the scores. It's a goal apiece and another ball. Then the two champions, Brown and Dacos, combined for yet another. Dacos, snap. Brown in the front spot and takes them out. With the Eagles unable to put up much opposition, Collingwood started to steamroll another goal to Manson. Francis, a high kick. Manson underneath it. Strong man. Should kick his second and Collingwood's third. Manson. Interesting but effective. There's the boundary throw in Collingwood there. has lacked a genuine oh, rover for years, but Tony Francis oh, has filled that role. Well, yeah, this brilliant effort from 50 down. metres Francis was a perfect oh, rover's go. goal. It's it's through for a goal. Michael Christian's the tremendous goal. endeavour led to another goal to Dacos. Dacos loves these and he kicks it. Then it was Mullane's turn with desperation all over his face. He charged through to boot this left foot goal. Left foot, and it's another one. Mick McGuan, under tremendous pressure, held his ground, and his goal made the difference 35 points. Oh, courageous mark by Mickey McGuan. Straight in front, high drop punt, good looking kick, and it's a goal. Well the Magpies were teaming brilliantly. Shaw, Shaw Christian, Wright, and finally Dacos for goal number two. Dacos is on over the top. 
Dacos, 25 metres out, settles and gets it. Then Kelly went forward, held a strong mark and booted one himself. 25 metres out, has got the goal. Gavin Krasiska swung onto his familiar left boot and at half-time the Magpies were cruising 12-6 to 4-5. It looked like it was heading for a massacre when Brown kicked the first of the third quarter. Then Dacos used his body beautifully to outmanoeuvre Warsfold to make the difference 10 goals. Great mark. And he's kicked two, 45 metres out, drop punt, and that's his third. Against but forward. suddenly things started to change. A lucky free kick saw Keane goal when Mick Gaifer was clearly pushed in the back. That's a terrible decision. And this to get West Coast back to eight goals. Drop punt, puts it through. Bland. And when Malaxos, Petty and Sumich Petty. teamed together, the Sumich. Eagles were on the way back. Well, just has to kick it. They've got to make 100% out of everything. Suddenly the difference was just 29 points when Dean Kemp threaded one through from the boundary and all the old fears started to flood back. It was 14-9 to 9-9 at the final break. Sumich missed an easy chance in the opening minutes. But the ever-reliable Brown marked to steady for Collingwood. Well, he's a bit unlucky. Will this be a famous Dacos torpedo goal? Not this time. Christian sets himself. And There's always the possibility that it will drop short. Brown's drop punts a goal. Brown's got four. The then Brown the found Christian. It comes to Christian. Long kick towards the kickoff line. Warsfold trying to force it behind. Over the ball was Dacos. Warsfold didn't have it. Brown away to Christian. And Christian's kicked the goal. Warsfold went at McGuan and gave Dacos just that little bit of breathing space and Dacos buried the goal. By this stage Collingwood were away and were toying with the Eagles as Collingwood could sense their first qualifying final victory and their first finals win since 1984. Russell kicked another. It may well be something like 20 goals to 9 or at least 19 to 9 if he gets this and he's got it. And when the siren went, the relief could be felt right around Waverley as Lee Matthews broke through for his first finals win. Final scores, Collingwood, 19-12, 126. The West Coast Eagles, 9-13-67. With the finals bogey finally out of the way, Collingwood then faced up to their first real test, Essendon, in the second semi-final. Having lost twice to the Bombers during the year, Essendon went into the match favourites, although there was some doubt after not playing for three weeks because of the qualifying final draw. Like the week before, Collingwood were off to a great start, but Kickett was able to receive a lucky free kick and score for the Bombers after Brown kicked through Collingwood's second. Kick by long to half forward. Almost a mark to Kelly. There's a push out. Essendon free kick to Kickett. I wonder if he'll go to the torpedo punt. He can kick them a long way. Goes for a long drop punt. It's got a big chance. Madden's there. Did it clear them for a goal? Yes, the Bombers first. Gavin Brown at full Our forward was proving far too start. mobile for Anthony Danaher Ewing and was a focal point up forward. Because Scott Russell's got it. Out towards Brown, he can take the mark and I think they might have to change the matchups there. I, I think don't like think Anthony Danaher's the man for Brown. 30 metres out, directly in front. Brown kicks right through it. It's another one to the Magpies. Paul Salmon Peter and Mark Bradford, Harvey were in good form for Essendon, and, and when Thompson, with great game. vision, found Harvey, Essendon Next were West right Australia. in the game. Salmon marks it to the half forward. Fires out the hand pass to Thompson. Open forward line. Harvey should run into an uncontested goal. Doug Barwick's long kicking had been a feature of his game all year and this one was no exception.
Free kicks are now 10 to 5 in favour of Collingwood. That was a very lucky free kick to Doug Barwick. He could kick this Barwick. He is a prodigious kicker of football. Kicking from outside 50. It is a magnificent kick. At quarter time, it was Collingwood 4 5 to 2 3. Then the old stages Lead for Essendon Haar. combined. Vanderhaar to Salmon, who pulled in a beautiful one handed mark. Last few weeks, Vanderhaar missed their practice match a couple of weeks ago. Salmon takes a great mark. Simon Madden cleverly. The second quarter saw Dacos get away from his tagger O'Donnell to volley the ball forward to Monkhorst, who did well to Shepherd for Gavin Brown. Tony Shaw, the Magpies forward again. Gary O'Donnell, oh, he waited back for it. Dacos, off the ground by Dacos. Monkhorst down the ground. Gavin Brown, a goal. Brilliant play by the Magpies. But the Bombers kept on Ten fighting, and hands. that old timer, Paul Vanderhaar, His pulled in a screamer. Vanderhaar! That was vintage Paul Vanderhaar. Watch this on replay. Behind, up he goes, the big fellow. 40 metres out. It's good. But at the but other end, Brown was on fire. His leading was arrow-like and his hands sure. Firstly, McGuan, and then Morwood found him and the Collingwood champ was able to convert. Brown about to play on. No, and his teammates are telling him, take your time and have a deliberate shot. He'll have to kick from about 49 metres. He's kicked three, this champion Collingwood player from 49 metres. A high floating drop, Pandit floats. I think it could be another one. Yes! McGuan loses it. Watson goes backwards. Harvey dispossessed The Collingwood by pressure was sensational. His brother led Collingwood in their last grand final. Off to Morwood. And Brown was soon lining up for goal number five. Well, Brown might have five, less than halfway through the second quarter. This could be eight kicks for five goals. Right in front and inside 50. He's done it again. Salmon, the big arms go up. Some joy for Essendon fans as Izard pulled Izzard in a screamer. The, back, the big fly, and he's taken a great mark. He loves those big ones from behind, Alan Izzard. Bomber Thompson sure never gave up do, trying Essendon. and was now a fine player Izzard. for the Bombers. Now they got Salmon all wet with the fly. Here's a chance. Mark Thompson, goal. And when Thompson set up Harvey, it looked like Essendon were going to be back in business, but to the delight of the Collingwood crowd, Harvey was offline. Harvey's had two sitters in this court. Derek Kickett showed some the magic off the half back line. Oh, was that a throw? The umpire said no, it's grabbed by Kickett. Two bounces. He Derek ran the Kickett. ball forward and allowed the big wide. fish, who he was just too big, to, to mark. Back to Kickett, he's got to wait underneath it. Gets his boot the ball. Seven at the back. Mark! Salmon was starting to influence the game, and at half time it was Collingwood 12 8 to Essendon 7 12. His left shoulder that he hurt. Brilliant play by Derek Kickett coming down the wing, fed it out. Look at the mark. He's just too big. I don't think they would. If he kicks this one, Paul Salmon from 20 and metres. The Bombers kicks. were oh, making a valiant it. comeback. Goal! The third quarter saw Essendon open Thompson. with a rush. Hand pass to the pacey Buick. Buick, Buick long, kicked long, long and Salmon, Salmon was just too tall yes, for Christian. He's too tall, and if they do that, if they get him one out, Don, he will be impossible to stop. But Buick, that's the beauty of the play. Now, Buick is in the back pocket or back flank, and now he's come up to centre wing and taken that kick. It was a beautiful kick. Missed an easy one, but this is directly in front. He should kick it from there. Paul Salmon just after half time kicks, and no doubt, right through the middle. Here's More trouble for Collingwood when Vanderhaar pulled in a great mark. A goal would have made the scores level. Again, a case of being too tall. We saw Salmon on Christian. Now it's Vanderhaar. A long way back. Vanderhaar taking a long run up. 
And Kelly running up to the mark. The kick was and touched off the boot, but it still looked as if Collingwood had stopped. It may have been, it was touched, it was touched by Kelly, who took about 10 metres back, ran at Van der Haar and touched the kick, and it's a behind. Collingwood needed Grand to show some courage. The, the Magpie stepped up a gear, and a and brilliant tackle from Francis throw. saw him restore the lead to 11 points. And it'll be a Collingwood free kick within kicking distance. Well, that's just about the perfect tackle, isn't it? The fact that one arm was pinned, he could either drop the ball or throw it. Watch this, look. He's pinned the arm, now what can he do? This for an 11-point lead. Good kick. Then Darren Mullane, despite a broken Hardly thumb, used brute through. strength to pull in a magnificent out. mark. He's out a high kick to centre wing. Anderson and Mullane. Oh, Mullane! Broken thumb and all. Great mark by Darren Mullane. Suddenly, Dacos from nowhere found space and, as usual, was pinpoint with his left foot kick. Christian from the back pocket. Graham Wright was to finish second in the 1990 Brownlow medal. This was part of the reason why. Well done, Graham Wright. That was fantastic play. Graham Wright at half back, no doubt with that decision, it was right, but Essendon making a lot of mistakes. Right. His pass to Stasovic set up contested. Russell, and Brad then Barwick was left ground, to let fly with a bomb, like a and the Magpie on. army went the wild. Short one, Scott Russell, here's the Magpie's chance. The running player is Barwick, he can thump it a mile. Look at that long kick. This might be a goal. Yes! Another one to the Magpies. But Barwick has kicked his second. The pressure from Collingwood was enormous. Eventually, Krasiska drives in the nail. Smothered off the hands. Well done, Barwick. Scott Russell looks for Francis. Good play down there by Buick. That was fantastic play. Watson's been quiet. Back he goes. Gary O'Donnell. They're not sure what to do. Oh, is that holding the ball? They're making a lot of mistakes. They're some due to the pressure. Krasiska. An open goal. Sisters kicked it, the Watson to Hamilton. Oh. Derek Pickett Ball. combined with Paul it. Salmon to make the difference 22 points before what many thought was Needs the turning point between the two sides. Van der Haas there, and Salmon takes the mark. That's his go, Salmon. And now it could cost them a goal. Man on the mark, just 12 metres out. And Salmon gets the goal. His third. Centre of the ground. Madden, Madden took a strong mark and was unlucky not to get a 50 metre penalty. But indecision between Madden and Derek Kickett, who was far too casual, left the door wide open for Scott Russell, who slammed it closed on the Bombers. He goes back to Kickett. Now to Madden again. Oh, they're going to muck this up. Kickett was being held before the ball even came back to him. Oh, he's gone oh. backwards, he's lost it. Russell gathers inside 50. Russell goes for goal and kicks it. Collingwood went into the final quarter leading by 28 points. Supporters still too nervous to even dream that this could be it, a clear passage into the grand final. But Russell, the South Australian star, booted another and the avalanche had begun. Goes to ground now from O'Donnell. Brown comes out with it, the hand pass. Comes to Russell. Russell snaps truly. Peter Dacos started doing party Francisco. tricks. 65 metres out. Short to Dacos. Oh, fingertip. Half four. Then Dougie Barwick found Collingwood. the big sticks He's for the Magpies. The Madden, punched by Monkhorst. Buick. Oh, another dangerous handball. They're running in all sorts of trouble. They refused More to kick pressure it, by it? Collingwood as they started There's to run Francis, in packs. Tony Shaw, a quick kick to the forward line. It could be a mark. Yes. Stasovic. And this will absolutely seal it. If he short passes this, he does. Across the face of the mark has been taken by Barwick. 25 metres out, directly in front. The Bombers, Third under extreme pressure, Sayers, had cracked. Magpies will be home if he kicks this one. Barwick kicks. 
And there it is. Then a Hamilton. magnificent but fighting effort pass. by and Brown Banks. saw the ball spill to Stasevich. Shaw's always there to pick those up. Pokes the hand pass over the top to McGuan. Here comes Mullane. Mullane approaches 60 metres. Long kick. Brown the only chance. Comes to the front. Brown again. Back he goes. Stasevich has kicked another one. Only 12 points at half. Dennis time Banks, the game. oldest Collingwood uh, player who fought back from half. so many injuries to be Hamilton part of this Isla. team, set up Stasevich yet Isla's again. Kick up the centre wing, congested. Turner a big fly. Comes to Gaffer. He knew his player was there, Banks. Banks pokes the ball to half forward and Stasevich marks. This one right in front, 45 metres out. There's another one. The Magpies were in for the kill. And almost like an encore performance, Dacos used his body beautifully and Collingwood were through to their first grand final since 1981. Tony Francis hooks it up in front of goal. Dacos in front. Can he do something magical? Yes, he can. Put his body in front and bang, he took it. Kick by Dacos. It's a goal. It would be the Magpies' 10th attempt to break one of sport's greatest runs of misery. Collingwood, 63-point thrashing over Essendon. Final scores, the Magpies, 17-15-117. Essendon, 7-12-54. So finally, seven months of training and playing, the AFL competition of 1990 was down to just two teams. Collingwood and Essendon, who had beaten the Eagles in the preliminary final. Easily the two best teams of the year. Collingwood in need of a week's break, fit and ready. Essendon in need of a hit out after the second semi toned up and ready to go. It was all set to be a classic grand final. Grand final week in Melbourne has become a festival, a seven day celebration of something uniquely Australian and even more so, the aspect of life held more dearly by Melburnians than anything else. And with the Magpies in the grand final with a real chance, the level of anticipation and fever seemed to reach new heights. The first real sign of this was at training at Victoria Park on the Thursday night, the Magpies last preparation before the moment of truth. Fans swarmed into Victoria Park for the final training session of 1990. It was like a match day, such was the feeling of excitement and anticipation. Vendors were doing a roaring trade, while the fight for anything black and white, regardless of the price, was like the fight for the very sustenance of life. Young boys born more than a quarter of a century after Collingwood's last win and nurtured in the Collingwood tradition were there to see their heroes. While some of the most respected members of Melbourne's community, like criminal lawyer and former player Frank Galbally, was deeply touched by the occasion. It's magnificent to be here because you see the mystique of Collingwood and their supporters here now. This can never happen to any other club and has never happened. We are unique and I think we'll make it. Others, like longtime supporter Juan Wazitsky, broke into song. I hope we win a flag before the world turns upside. We're gonna win a flag before the world turns upside down. 
Buildings were adorned with the tribal colours, but the biggest roar was saved for the men who would provide either the agony or the ecstasy, the players themselves. <laughs> Lee Matthews, hooted for years as a Hawthorne player who often dashed the hopes of the Collingwood fans, was given special hero worship as he walked stony-faced onto the ground. They will win. No risk whatsoever. I uh, feel quite confident about the game, Eddie, but again, uh, it depends on uh, us performing at our peak. I think this is the best team that I've seen uh, for quite, probably since 1970. They're going to win. Because they're better than this, isn't they? The night had its own drama. Alan Richardson was put through a fitness test to see whether his shoulder injury had healed from the second semi-final. A lifelong Magpie supporter, he would do anything to be part of the grand final action. Sadly, although named in the side, his injury provided too much risk when the stakes were so high. To the eve of the match, and a dozen players felt up to facing the crowds again, this time in the grand final parade. Their bus greeted along the roadway with well wishes. The players were then greeted with an unprecedented crowd as they made their way down Burke Street in the heart of Melbourne, cheered all the way by their adoring fans. We're really looking forward to the clash. It should be a great day. Hopefully the weather will be like this. It'll be a great event. Um, the centre bounce caps everything off. You know, uh, It's a good spectacle for the spectators, but you know, we're out there to play football, so I'm looking forward to the centre bounce. We're sort of hoping we can do it. You know, We'll put everything in and uh, see how it goes. Playing in these a few times before as a player, does it feel a bit different as a coach? Um, oh, yes. Well, you know, physically you're not down to put yourself on the line tomorrow, so it's a gigantic difference there. This was the players' final public appearance. The next time they would be seen, they would be facing the 20 men of Essendon Stripped for action for the greatest prize in Australian sport, the AFL Premiership. So the final preparations had been made. The teams picked and despite all the hype, all the preparation and training, a whole year's work and for many a lifetime's dream was in the hands of just 20 men. When the ball was bounced at 2.30pm on Saturday, October the 6th. A beautiful Melbourne spring day, only blustery wind taking away from ideal conditions. The two teams hit the ground, no change in the Essendon lineup. Collingwood brought Shane Kerrison in for the injured Alan Richardson. The two teams stood nervously as Normie Rowe sang the national anthem. A huge roar from 98,000 spectators at Australia's premier venue. Essendon captain Tim Watson won the toss and elected to kick towards the city end or big scoreboard end of the MCG. Both teams grouped together for the last time. The Magpies in a tight huddle reaffirming their commitment to each other in this their moment of truth. Finally, after one of the most intense finals build-ups in football history, the grand final of 1990, Collingwood versus Essendon, was underway. Collingwood opened well and attacked the punt road end with ferocity, but they were being caught outside 50 metres and under pressure. At the six and a half minute mark of the first quarter, Hamilton for Essendon kicked long and high, and Paul Salmon, the man Collingwood supporters feared the most, marked and kicked the first for the game, Essendon one goal, Collingwood two behinds. Ten minutes later and Essendon's second goal was on the board. Again, Salmon on the end of a Chris Danaher pass. The Bombers two goals in front and Collingwood supporters starting to worry. They know their team plays better after getting off to a strong start. Salmon punts for goal. He's happy. It's there. 
Collingwood just needed an icebreaker. And 21 and a half minutes in, it came in the form of a Peter Dacos miracle. Look at the gather. The right foot snap. This is a miraculous kick. It was Dacos's 96 for the year, but a more important goal the great man has never kicked. Then, just before quarter time, full forward Gavin Brown, using his brilliant pace and agility, turned a tight angle into an open goal, and Collingwood led by three points. With the quarter time siren came what many believe was the turning point of the game. A scuffle involving Magpies Dennis Banks and Craig Kelly developed with Essendon's Kieran Spawn. Brown rushed in to lend support. Suddenly, Terry Danaher hit Brown, and it was on with everyone included. And when I say everyone, I mean it. Players, officials, trainers, and even Channel 7 commentator Bernie Quinlan was mixed up in the action. The result, however, was that Collingwood champion Gavin Brown had to be escorted to the bench in the arms of trainers. Knocked out and out of the game, Magpie fans dropped their heads in disbelief. But while this may have been enough to deflate many sides, it acted as an inspiration to Brown's Collingwood teammates. Matthew swung Damien Monkhurst into the ruck, a player who'd been out of touch against the best ruckman in the game, Simon Madden. Within a minute, Stasevich took a mark and was bumped a little late by Terry Danaher. The umpire, looking to assert authority on the game, gave a 50-metre penalty, and the Magpie skipped to a nine-point lead. Three minutes later, and Gavin Krasiska broke clear on his left foot and goal. The ball breaks free. It's all Collingwood. Krasiska hits towards goal. The game was tight and tough, Essendon holding on grimly, but Collingwood could sense a lift in spirit. Scott Russell applied another tackle on Izard, who gave away another 50-metre penalty in frustration, and the brilliant Ruck Rover made the difference 22 points. Then the Magpies cracked Essendon wide open. Krasiska pulled in a strong mark and from 20 metres out made no mistake and the Pies were hot. 28 points in front, eight and a half minutes into the second quarter. The Collingwood crowd were in a frenzy as the black and white machine rolled on relentlessly. Russell received the push in the back and after 10 minutes of play in the second quarter, the Pies were 34 points up. It took until the 14-minute mark of the quarter for Essendon to score their first point since the 16-minute mark of the first term. Buick dodging and weaving couldn't find the goals. But just as Dacos sparked Collingwood in the first quarter, Derek Kickett snapped a miracle goal. Could this be the revival? Trying to keep it in. Kicked by Watson. Up towards full forward. No mark. Touched away. Now Kickett gets his right foot to the ball. It's fair through. Miraculous goal by Kickett. And the Bombers come back. Terry Danaher. Christian but Danaher. just before half time, Barwick was set to mark at centre half forward. Buick gave him a rib tickler and a 50 metre penalty saw Collingwood go in at half time, leading by 34 points.
And even the most pessimistic of Collingwood supporters were asking, could this finally be the year? The Magpies had not lost a game in 1990 after leading at half-time. And Matthews, yelling abuse at Terry Danaher going in at the half-time break, was not going to let his side sit back and watch. In grand finals, we've all referred to it before as the Collie We've got a half a football left. Collingwood needed to keep the initiative. Stasevich, who had been playing so well, was collected by Terry Danaher, who had become Collingwood's number one enemy. KO'd, his kick and 50-metre penalty was converted by Mick McGuan and Collingwood moved to a 38-point margin. As Stasevich exited, Gavin Brown KO'd himself at the end of the first quarter, came on to the roar of the crowd. He ran straight at Terry Danaher and chested him. His action showed that Collingwood could take the best the Bombers could give and come back and give some more. It was one of the most memorable moments of this game. The hunger after 32 years of starvation was insatiable. Dacos only kicked two goals for the day, but both were gems. His second came from nearly out of the realms of probability. The Collingwood fans were delirious. Everything was going right. The drought surely was about to burst. Now watch this. Here he is behind Thompson. He picks it up. Now it's on his right foot. He's more or less got his body side on. Peter Somerville, the surprise inclusion in the Essendon side, marked and from 40 metres out, kicked Essendon's first for the quarter. Looking for and finding Somerville. This was matched a minute later when David Grenvold brought up six points from 25 metres out. That should be paid, it is. Usually a pretty good kick, David Grenvold. And he stabs at it and puts it through. Essendon get another one. Then at the 25 minute mark, supreme pressure saw the ball flip into the hands of Brown and his comeback was complete when he split the middle of the goals. Turner's caught, but he gets his foot to the ball and kicks it to the front of the square. Oh, nearly Brown. Essendon under pressure. Brown will kick a goal. And if that doesn't bring the roof off the MCG, nothing will. With a quarter to go, only those who had seen Collingwood lose from similar, seemingly invincible positions were worried. And that was nearly everyone. At three-quarter time, Collingwood led 11-10-76 to 5-6-36. It's the last address that Matthews would give for the year. Collingwood has set up the win. Now all they have to do is maintain their composure and fight like hell for 30 more minutes. A long kick. The Up final quarter was a scrappy line. affair with Essendon totally spent. In past years, the final quarter of a grand final has seen nothing go right for the Magpies. This time, it was Essendon's turn. Twice Simon Madden missed gifts. One of the greats of the game and the most experienced player on the field. Firstly, he hit the post from 15 metres. Then he kicked into the man on the mark. At the 19-minute mark, Doug Barwick snapped a goal and a burden carried by all Collingwood fans for 32 years is starting to lift. A rumble builds into a roar and good old Collingwood forever is being heard throughout Australia. But nothing like the centre of the world at that moment, the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Big Damien Monkhorst, who had played so well, closed the chapter on Australian sports' most celebrated and talked about losing run. Lee Matthews, the stoic coach, decided it was time to be on the ground. He'd dominated as a player. His show of jubilation, one of the great moments captured on this field of sporting memories. And finally, the ball in the hand of Darren Mullane, his thumb held together since round 21 by tape as the siren sounds the Magpies are Premiers. Final scores, Collingwood, 13-11-89, Essendon, 5-11-41. Alan McAllister and Lee Matthews, Tony Shaw, he's seen his brother play and lose grand finals, and now he is the champion. Let's go down onto the ground with Michael Roberts. 
For the first time in more than three decades, the proud black and white stripes stood for victory once more. And there to accept the cup, the Norm Smith medalist and a man who epitomises Collingwood, the captain Tony Shaw. And the coach, Lee Matthews, who took a club struggling for survival just four years ago, all the way down the road to victory. just cut down the folklore of Australian sport. You know, it, you start off, you know, we know we had a good patch during the year, but they've played, the finals are won by the side that plays best in September, and, and they've done it. And they, uh, you know, the 20 of them, they've just been tremendous. Uh, is it better uh, as a coach and as a player to win a flag uh, league? I don't know whether it matters much. No, I, I always said to the guys, the 20 blokes that perform, it's them. I mean, everyone else is happy for them. We support them when we can, but they enjoy it the most. They'd be disappointed the most if they didn't win it. Uh, there's no replacement for that feeling that those guys have got because they physically earned it. They were just magnificent. When did you feel that you had it all wrapped up? Well, about the 20 minute mark of the last quarter, I suppose. 25 minute mark of the last quarter. I mean, I suppose, in retrospect, we sort of seem to have it the, most of the second half, but I mean, you never know, do you, that, what can happen? And, oh, it's just been part of my football upbringing. I don't expect anything until it's there and in, and in uh, reality. And once we got to the 25 minute mark, eight in front, and but only get two or three goals. Well, you said, well, we've got it. You can't help but admire them, Bruce. They're fantastic throughout the whole season, and their performances over the finals just first class. They really were. Ronnie McEwen, I feel for him a bit at the moment, oh, don't you? Ella oh, Richardson. Yeah. Well, see, look, one thing about Lee Matthews, he's had to make the tough decisions, and he's made them. And if the grand final itself was memorable, the scenes that night and over the whole weekend of unbridled joy and celebration were unprecedented in Australia. Strangers hugged and kissed, grown men wept, and they all sang the song. The Collywobbles were dead. The years of frustration over. The Magpies were number one again. It had happened. The dream was finally a reality. Collingwood premieres 1990. It still didn't feel real. While the crowd went wild, Ron McEwen, left out of the team for balance, stood silently in the players' race, glad for his teammates, but devastated to have missed out himself. But the players were soaking in every minute, every sight and every sound of the greatest moment in their lives. Yeah, you play a long time, but uh, 13 years it's all been worth it, mate. I just can't believe it. That's what it's all about. I mean, we've kept our head down all year, and, uh, and this is what's eventuated, and I mean, it's... Good luck to the boys that take it in now. I mean, it's an unbelievable feeling. It's one of the best efforts of all time. We just put everything in. It's just brownie and sure and fantastic. Oh, yeah, you know, we've been put a lot of hard work in. And, uh, no, it's paid off now, so thanks for that. Oh, fantastic. I just uh, can't think of times when it's happening. And I just said to Wayne Richardson, this is really happening, isn't it? Inside the rooms, Lee Matthews had decreed that wives and girlfriends of the players be part of the celebration. Emotion spilled over in a total outburst of joy and relief. Bob Rose, who had had his heart broken so many times, summed it all up. We're very the collie wobbles, mate, and uh, we're just looking ahead to better, big and better things. And a big night tonight? Well, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, as long as the players are happy, that, that suits me. They've, they've had a big year, and uh, thank goodness they've won this big flag. 
while the coach remained ever level-headed. We come here today knowing we can win, which we have, knowing we could lose too, and Essendon lost, and uh, they're the ones who are depressed tonight, but it could have been us, I mean, and that's the realities of the competition, we think. It was an emotional end to the first quarter at half-time, you waited for Terry Danaher, you had a word to him, how are you feeling at that stage? Oh, well, you do a lot of things, once the game, 120 minutes of the game, we were all heated up. After that, it's all gone and buried. It was all fired up, though, wasn't it? There was that great feeling after that uh, first quarter cracker. Well, we played well. We got the break early in the second quarter and got clear. Mm. Well, how do you feel now? I feel uh, like I always, have, even as a player, an enormous uh, sense of uh, sort of pride in the guys and uh, relief that it's over, that the pressure of... You know, you feel a bit of a relief even if you lose in a way, but to have the relief of the pressure and having won, well, we can all be just feeling terrific. At a special dinner at the Southern Cross that night, the players, one by one, were introduced on stage. Matthews paid special tribute to Alan Richardson and Ron McEwen, who were unlucky not to be in the grand final side, and to his president, Alan McAllister. And you doubt yourself as coach when you do the right things, when you're playing the right players, when you're training the right way, all those things float through your mind. And Alan gave me enormous confidence when he just kept telling me to keep doing it the way you think it should be done and to have the confidence to back your own judgment and the support that he's given me in terms of president to coach is something that I just can't thank him enough for. And finally, to his players. And nothing surpasses what those 20 players have done today. That is the greatest feeling in football. For me as a coach, it is simply the fact that you put your judgment and you put your faith in certain people. The uh, satisfaction I get is the faith and judgment of the people that I put into was justified by their performance today and for that I'll be honoured and I thank them for the rest of my life. The President was still finding it hard to comprehend. It's a dream that's finally come true after so long. And what could be forgiven for really wondering whether it would ever happen. If the partying at the Southern Cross was one thing, what was happening at Victoria Park was unbelievable. The sight of which most players agreed was the highlight of their careers. The whole world seemed to be celebrating Collingwood's win. As night turned into day, the celebrations went on and on and on. The Collywobbles could be toasted, not hidden from anymore. The president, well, he was still talking of dreams. And I said to Wayne Richardson, is this, is it really is happening, isn't it? I don't want to disappoint them. He said, no, Alan, that's happened. And that was terrific. And the captain, Tony Shaw, he wouldn't have swapped the cup for anything or anyone. It was the greatest thing I've ever slept with in my life. I'm sorry. sorry, Deb. Even a young boy who had lost his parents soon forgot his troubles when he got his hand onto the Holy Grail. The ridicule was over. Victory at last. After 32 years, the Premiership was again a cakewalk for the good old Collingwood.